Hello YouTube, Sidekick here with another episode of the Iron Bomber's Guide to the DCS Galaxy. Today we're going to talk about the fine art of rocket science. We're going to spend a bit of time going back over the history of unguided air-launched rockets, and then we're going to take a look at how these weapons are modeled in DCS. This is probably going to be the first of a two-part series. In the second part, uh, we'll actually go and work out some rules for properly employing rockets, especially in aircraft that don't have HUDs that provide automatic aiming, uh, like the A-4 or the F-86. But before we get there, we need to understand a bit more about how rockets work and how they developed as an air-to-ground weapon system. So, fair warning up front, um, there is every chance that this video will exceed even the normally high nerd quotient of my regular videos by a significant margin. Um, and this is because, as many of you may know, rockets are a bit of a thing for me, given that I have spent my professional life in and around the space program. If you want to know more about that, uh, you should check out my podcast called Terranauts, where I talk about working in space uh, without ever leaving the ground. But in addition to that, I have a direct connection to modern ground attack rockets because my father worked on the development of a Canadian 2.75-inch rocket called the CRV-7, which is still in use today with most NATO countries other than the U.S. So, let the nerding out begin. First of all, what's a rocket? Well, that's easy. A rocket is just a bomb with a hole in one end. Really. To make a rocket, the easiest thing to do is to take a bunch of explosives, pack them into a tube, and put a hole in one end of the tube. Contrive to ignite the explosives, and hey, presto, your tube will egress rapidly in a direction more or less corresponding to away from the end with the hole in it. I say more or less because unless you do some other particular things, there's no real guarantee of exactly where it will go, as early rocket pioneers discovered. Now, such solid fuel rockets have been around for a long time, probably more than a thousand years. They were, actually, fairly common in the 19th century. In British service, they were known as Congreve rockets. The problem of how to launch them and how to keep them going more or less in the direction of the target uh, was solved by mounting the rocket on the top of a long pole. The issue in the 1800s was that the quality of artillery was increasing ra rapidly, and so rockets were kind of short-range, not very powerful, and a lot less accurate than the artillery shells of the day, so they weren't really in widespread use. Uh, now, rockets were used a bit in the First World War, but again, not really widely. They were kind of used for signaling and that sort of work. Um, pretty much any application where the warhead or the payload of the rocket was such that it was fragile enough that you didn't really want to fire it out of a cannon. Between the wars, the science of rocketry took some major leaps forward. Uh, without going into a lot of the details, the main advances were in the propellant and also in the nozzle design. The effect was to dramatically increase the potential range and speed of rockets, but also to improve their accuracy by having nozzles that more reliably directed the exhaust. And in fact, in the Second World War, ground-based rocket artillery would become a standard part of both the Russian and German armies, and often with devastating effect. The development of the aerial rocket was hurried along in the prelude to the Second World War and, and in its early years because the value of air-to-ground attack started to become clear to, well, everybody. Uh, so most countries began to experiment with air-launched rockets because, you see, the advantage of a rocket over a bomb is basically that it offers a much simpler uh, targeting solution. Dropping a bomb from an aircraft, as many of you know, is a fiendishly difficult task that takes a huge amount of skill and practice to get right. Effectively, in World War II, accurate delivery of bombs on a point target was most easily accomplished by a purpose-built dive bomber like the JU-87 Stuka or the SBD Dauntless. They were designed to dive from high altitude and at high dive angles, and this allowed the pilot to actually see the target all the way through the dive and to accurately determine the point of release. But, as the war progressed, there was an increasing need for multi-role aircraft that could act both as fighters and as tactical bombers. And more and more tactical bombing was being performed by aircraft that weren't actually designed for high-angle dive bombing. 
getting rounds on target in these aircraft was just a whole lot harder than it was in a dive bomber. Now, on the other hand, these aircraft were excellent at strafing targets with cannon and machine guns, so what was needed was a weapon that would combine the forward-firing nature of a cannon eh, with the payload of a bomb, which, of course, was a rocket. Now, the Western Allies started deploying rockets probably in about 1941. The initial rockets were called Forward-Firing Aerial Rockets, or FFARs, not to be confused with later folding fin aerial rockets, which are also called FFARs. They were based around a warhead of a 5-inch naval shell with a rocket tube and some fins attached to it. Eh, they were pretty underpowered and they weren't very accurate. But they showed enough promise that a second generation was rapidly developed to correct the shortcomings of the earlier versions. This eventually became the HVAR, or HVAR, the High Velocity Aerial Rocket which was still based around the same size warhead, but now the rocket was the same size as the warhead. The propellant was upgraded also significantly, and there were versions that could be launched from tubes, which gave them some additional directional stability. As they would emerge from the tube, the fins would pop out and begin making the rocket rotate to keep it flying straight. The improvement over the original rockets was pretty dramatic, and the HVARs quickly became a staple of U.S. and Allied fighter bombers. Now, while the HVAR was, at the time, a major improvement over the initial aerial rocket, it was still a pretty short-range solution, and if you've ever used them in a flight sim, um, you will be genuinely shocked at just how close to the target you have to be for them to be effective. And so they really don't provide any standoff, and there is no way to deliver them effectively um, and avoid any point defense AAA that might be in the target area. In short, uh, they're a good solution for improving precision, but not much for improving survivability. So after World War II, effort went into continuing to improve the rocket range and accuracy so they could be used from safer distances from targets. In addition, the west to, on the western side, the large 5-inch diameter rockets were joined by a smaller diameter rocket, uh, the 2.75-inch variety. Now these were actually developed originally as an anti-aircraft rocket, uh, that was supposed to counter the threat of high-speed, high-altitude bombers. In this role, they were pretty much useless, though. Um, but along the way, it was realized that the smaller rockets would provide a solution for aircraft that couldn't carry the heavier, large-diameter rockets. Uh, and they also uh, began providing an attractive solution for arming helicopters. So the rocket family divided uh, into two families, uh, with the smaller-diameter rockets like the U.S. 2.75-inch variety and Russian S-8s, 80mm rockets, and larger diameter rockets like the Zuni or the Russian S-13, which were pretty much the direct descendants of the HVAR. Now, over the course of the 1960s and the early 70s, doctrine in the West uh, have diverged to some extent. The West has tended to emphasize smaller diameter rockets, while Russia and its allies have continued to develop some very significant large diameter rockets. So, at least initially, I'm going to look mostly at the Western rockets, just because I fly mostly Western aircraft, at least from this era, and also because sources of information on them are a little bit easier to come by. Um, if you guys are interested, I can do another episode looking at Russian rockets. So, let's take a look at the two post-World War II Western rockets modeled in DCS. On the heavy side, the HVAR was replaced by the Zuni 5-inch rocket in 1957. On the light rocket side, the initial work on the first version of the folding fin aerial rocket known as the Mark IV or Mighty Mouse began in the 1940s on the air-to-air -air version, but by the 1950s it had been converted to an air-to-ground version and was being used to arm the first generation of jets, including the F-86 and the CF-100. The early FFARs uh, had some significant shortcomings. The early Mark IV was superseded by the Mark 40 which had a much more powerful motor and was much longer ranged. The Mark 40 eventually was superseded by the Hydra 70, which upgraded the engine significantly again, but also added some modifications to improve the accuracy of the rocket, mostly by adding a better fin deployment mechanism, but also by changing the angle of the motor slightly to actually start the rocket spinning before the fins were fully open. The two types of rockets work on similar principles. They're carried in launchers consisting of multiple tubes, each of which contains a rocket. When launched, the tubes provide some initial aiming. As the rockets leave the tube, 
the set of fins unfolds and causes the rocket to spin, but there is no active guidance provided to the rocket once it leaves the tube. So the art of using these rockets, similar to iron bombs, is to know how to point the aircraft such that when launched, the rockets will actually fly to hit the target. And doing that is all about knowing your range to target. Which, of course, is not all that different than dropping bombs. But, in contrast to bombs, the dive angle and speed play, well, much less of a role. Mm, mostly. I say mostly because it really does depend on that range to the target. See, because rockets are different than bombs. From the time they're dropped, bombs are always falling away from their initial trajectory. But for rockets, their trajectory is very flat for a certain period of time, like while the motor's burning and for a little while after that. And, but once the rocket's forward velocity starts to slow and friction takes over, the rocket starts to act more like a bomb and starts to fall away from its initial trajectory. Um, what this means is that in a rocket attack, the, if the pilot launches anywhere inside this sort of flat trajectory window, the deflection will always be the same and it'll be pretty small. But if, on the other hand, the pilot launches from outside the flat trajectory window, more deflection is going to be needed, and the amount of deflection is going to start to depend not only on the range, but also the dive angle and the speed, just like a bomb. So rocket deflection tables are, or should be, uh, a bit different than the deflection table for a bomb. The trick is to determine how long that flat, tra flat trajectory window is. For ranges that are less than this value, the site deflection is constant and pretty much independent of other flight parameters. Once you get outside that flat trajectory window, though, you're going to want a table that looks more like a bombing table with a deflection that depends on altitude and speed. The trick, of course, is that figuring out the flat trajectory window is not straightforward. It's not something that's published anywhere, at least as far as I know, and even if it was, there'd be no guarantee that the behavior of the rockets in DCS would follow it closely. But I think there's another way we can check it. If we go out and fly a jet that has a HUD, that shows both a CCIP pipper and a flight path vector, and which can carry rockets, then we should actually be able to um, look at the expected trajectory of the rockets by looking at the difference between the flight path vector and the pipper that the computer calculates while we make the target run. And we don't even actually have to fire the rocket. So why don't we go give that a try? All right, here we are rolling down the runway at Caboletti in... Uh our trusty hog with the uh, Fantasy RCAF livery. I can dream, you know. So we'll just get off the runway here. And uh, again, the purpose of the mission today is not so much to go out and, uh, and uh, attack stuff as to get a look at what the uh, A-10 HUD looks like uh, when we're carrying rockets. So we're just going to um, get up and get started here. So we're going to need to get fenced in so that uh, the aircraft recognizes that we're carrying rockets. So we'll get those on the pipper. So let's get our dismiss up here, enable the rockets, and we'll get the HUD with uh, the appropriate pipper once we get sorted out. I guess we want the uh, master arm on there. That, uh, that's better. And nope, don't want CCRP or NAV or guns. We want CCIP. Okay, good. All right, well, I'm going to take it out to the range and uh, do a trim run and get ready, but I don't think we'll record all of that. So I'll catch you after uh, we're ready to do our first run here. Okay, so I'm just pulling up from the range after having done a trim run. Just a reminder uh, for everybody out there, if, if you don't know what a trim run is, uh, you can check some of my earlier videos. I'm more and more convinced that this is an essential part of any uh, ground attack plan, is to make sure that you do a trim run somewhere, um, get the aircraft trimmed out. What you want to do is get it full power, shallow dive, uh, and make sure that the nose is staying absolutely steady. And this is just a way to make sure that when you're actually roll in and are in your attack run, that the aircraft is not fighting you, not trying to climb or dive. It's staying where you pointed it. Uh, it's really essential to be quiet on the stick uh, if you want to be accurate. Even when you've got a great HUD like the A10C, it's still really important to be trimmed out right. So need to do that before we go and do these runs. So the purpose of the runs here today, again, look at the, 
range there behind us. The purpose of the runs today um, is to look at the flight path vector, which is that little um, circle with the three lines in it. And when we're diving in, we want to compare it to the reticle for the rockets. And um, then offline after we're done today, I'm going to go out, I'm going to go take this video and do some uh, photogrammetry. Here's another word that's a blast from my past. Anyways, I'm going to do some photogrammetry. I'm going to measure the actual distance between the pipper and the flight path vector. Uh, and I'm going to convert that into mills of sight deflection. So we can just confirm uh, what we think we know about the rockets, about how uh, the trajectory works. So I don't think I'm going to do that in the video today. It's already a fairly long video. I don't think we'll have time to do it today. But in the next episode, I'll show you the results of that. And we'll pick up where we left off. Maybe maybe we'll do a little bit more uh, putting warheads on foreheads in the next video. This one's been a the fairly theoretical one, but I think it was important. It's important for me to get my head wrapped around how rockets work, and hopefully this is helping you do that too. Okay, so we're going to roll in. I'm just going to put the flight path vector on the target. And I'm going to try and leave it there. Just going to watch target reticle. Get settled here. Nice and quiet. I don't really want to be pulling on the stick because that'll affect things. Okay, so now if you watch the reticle, you see it is still moving up towards the flight path vector. The distance between the two is getting smaller and smaller. Pull up, pull up. Went all the way in nice and close. Okay, let's pull up. Yeah, that was a pretty good run, but it started at about two kilometers. I think I'd like to get one where I start a little bit further back. So it looked to me like the, I have to confirm this when I go do the measurements, but it looks like the reticle is moving up until we're pretty close to the target, which is interesting. So, um, you know, just to confirm that the actual um, range of the rockets where they are, their trajectory is flat is pretty close to the target, which means that if you want the rockets to be hitting the target when they're still going at a pretty good velocity, and you really do want to be launching the rockets pretty close to the target. And, and this is something that I think maybe I wasn't aware of with the modern rockets. It's a little bit more obvious when you come at this um, from a World War II simulation. When I went back and started looking at the P-47, you know, IL-2 admittedly, not DCS, and looking at the range at which you had to launch the rockets, I realized just how close uh, you had to be to make those rockets work. And that, um, I realized that in DCS, I have tended to treat rockets as much more of a standoff weapon, um, trying to get farther back from the target. And I'm not sure that that's the right way to do it. So that's one of the things I've learned in uh, doing this video. I think I'm gonna confirm that hopefully when we start. Uh, well, from the data from the, the A-10, but next week we'll also take the A-4 out and do some uh, some manual calculation of its uh, site deflection and see if we can establish how those rockets work as well. See what kind of range is the range you want to be using them in. But my suspicion is right now that I'm going to find that I need to use rockets a lot closer to the target than I had typically been doing. See, you, when you come into flying the A-4, especially in the middle of the Vietnam era, when there's so much flak around, you feel the same way that I think pilots did and aircraft designers did in the late 1960s, early 70s, that that aircraft were just not survivable enough against the uh, anti-aircraft threats that they were facing. And so they were really looking for a way to increase the standoff distance. And I kind of treated rockets like that's what they should be. But I'm kind of coming to the same conclusion that I think uh, pilots and designers at the time did, which is that they're not really a great solution for that. Okay, rolling in again for a non-weapons pass. Once again, just going to try and move the flight path vector up to the target. Then I'm just going to try and leave it there. So, you know, as you can see, this is where the trim really comes in handy, because if it wasn't trimmed right, I'd be fighting with that flight path factor, trying to keep it over the target, and that would be affecting the results. I'm really not putting any pressure on the stick right now. I'm just letting the reticle move up to the flight path factor, and you can see it's moving up. Distance between them is definitely getting smaller. A little hard to tell as we're going exactly when they stabilize, but in somewhere around there, it's not moving very fast. 
So it looks like you got to be within a nautical mile, which is what, 2,000 yards, 2,000 meters, a little bit less than that, um, before you really get to the point where the rocket trajectory, at least where the site thinks the rocket trajectory is flat. Now, one thing I have noticed with the A-10 is that the reticle is always pretty far below the flight path vector, and I don't think that's because the rockets fall. I think it's because the actual uh, rocket, uh, the, the LAO launchers are on the A-10 are actually aimed a little downward, and that's why we have a bit of a uh, deflection on the site. Okay, well, that was interesting, but not interesting for me. I'm going to go and take a look at that data. Maybe not so interesting for you guys. So why don't we uh, at least put some warheads on some foreheads here uh, before we go home. Is there really nothing? And there is a little parking lot of the M113s down there by that white hangar at the front of the center sort of target collection that I think is just uh, begging to have some rockets fired at it. So let's go around again and see if we can, uh, what we can do about that. So I think rockets do get a bit of a bad name, um, you know, especially in Western aircraft, especially when there are so so many now, so many precision guided munitions. I mean, certainly 2.75 inch rockets are nothing compared to uh, Mavericks, but you can carry a lot more of them. Uh, and then, you know, of course, now you, you've got the uh, the guided version of the rockets, which are phenomenal. But but up until really uh, the late 1990s. Um, you know, this was pretty much what was available for most uh, attack aircraft, other than some that were really quite specialized um, and were carrying the Maverick. Even in the first Gulf War, very few Mavericks were fired. A lot of rockets were fired. So um, let's go see what rockets can do when we use them properly. So, uh, you know, based on what I've learned, um, you know, standard attack, need to stay nice and quiet, need to get the pipper on the target, but also need to get good and close um, to make sure that they're effective. And um, we'll see how accurate we can get with these uh, Hydra 70s. All right, rolling in. Okay, bring in that flight path vector up to the target. And now bring in the pipper up to the target. Just let it walk up there. Let's just hold it there a little while longer. Here we go, first couple. Well, I'd say we covered that target pretty well. And that was, uh, you know, not the shortest range. That was just at 1.7, 1.8 nautical miles. Not fairly near the maximum range that at least the A-10 wants to use those rockets. So uh, that looked like a pretty good strike to me. Anyways, lots more to talk about rockets going to be at least one more episode of these where we do a little bit more flying. Thanks for tuning in and uh, suffering through the ground school on this stuff. Hopefully hopefully it'll be worth it and improve your ability to use uh, air-to-ground rockets. For now, this is going to be Sidekick. Signing off.